Hi everyone, we're going to look at the Queen's Gambit Declined Cambridge Springs Variation. So the Queen's Gambit is this position. Black can decline it with e6, and then knight c3, knight f6, common moves, bishop g5, pinning the knight. And now the most common way to get out of the pin is to play bishop to e7. But another way you can play is knight to d7 to support the knight. And this sets a cunning trap that a lot of new players fall into if they don't know the theory. Um, white should just continue to develop here with either knight to f3 or e3. But it looks like black is losing a pawn here on d5 since white has two attackers on that pawn. And currently black has only one defender because that knight on f6 is pinned. However, it's a poisoned pawn. Let's see what happens if white tries to grab it. Well, black recaptures with the pawn and says, go ahead and take it, and white should decline to take it. He's doing okay right in this position, but if he takes the pawn on d5, then he's losing. He's losing because of a tactic. Black takes the knight, leaving his queen on prise on d8. White has nothing better than to take the queen since he just lost a knight, but black gets the queen back with bishop to b4 check. And there are no moves to get out of check other than blocking with the queen. Black gets the queen back, calls check, white recaptures, and then black captures white's bishop. And after all of those exchanges, black is simply up a piece. That is known as the elephant trap in the Queen's Gambit decline. So don't fall for that. As a player of the black pieces, you know, if you're a, a lower level player, you might consider playing knight to d7 here rather than bishop to e7 just to allow the opportunity for your opponent to fall into that trap. But knight to d7 also signals that black may want to play something called the Cambridge Springs variation. So white continues here with e3, okay, once his bishop is out, is, has been developed, it's now outside of that pawn chain, so that's a sensible move, opening up the diagonal for the light squared bishop, which now protects the pawn on c4. Okay, black continues with c6, bolstering his center, making this nice triangle of pawns that you see in the semi-slav defense, but also opening up a diagonal for the queen. White plays knight f3, getting closer to castling on the king side, and now the move queen to a5 is the beginning of the Cambridge Springs variation. So what's the point of this move? Well, there are two features you want to be aware of all the time in the Cambridge Springs. One is this queen is putting indirect pressure on that bishop on g5. And sometimes amateur players that don't know the theory end up losing that bishop in this opening at some point. Okay, but another feature of the position you should be aware of is that knight on f6 has been unpinned by moving the queen off of d8. So that knight can actually come to the e4 square and put further pressure on that pinned c3 knight. So that's the purpose of the opening. The name Cambridge Springs, the Cambridge Springs defense, comes from a tournament that was played in 1904 in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania, where this particular opening was featured in many games. Although it was played prior to that by the world champion Emmanuel Lasker in 1892. That's the first uh, record we have of this opening being played. Okay, so let's look at some responses white might make to this move queen to a5. We'll take a look at four moves here. The main line move continues knight to d2, kind of a strange retreating move but it does make sense because that does unpin the knight on c3, and this knight can come to b3 in some lines and attack that queen. 
Okay, well, black probably should play bishop to b4, completing the development of the king side, getting ready to castle on that side of the board, and putting further pressure down this diagonal. All right, so knight to b3 attacking the queen can be met with bishop takes c3, winning a pawn. All right, and black is threatening to win a pawn now by taking on c3, so white normally plays queen to c2 to defend that c3 knight. Okay, black can castle, and now the main move for white is bishop to e2, but there's another trap in the position. I have seen opponents of mine make the mistake of playing bishop to d3 in the position, which is a normal move you make in other queen's gambit declined lines. You want to develop that bishop to the most active square, but that drops a piece to the move d takes c4. So that attacks the bishop, and it reveals this attack on that g5 bishop, something you always have to be aware of in the Cambridge Springs. So there's nothing white can do to save a piece if he tries taking this knight, removing his bishop from capture. Then you take this bishop, and now the queen and the bishop are hanging. And so still in that line, white loses a piece. All right, so that's why players play that bishop to e2 instead of d3. Now, black can continue with d takes c4 anyway, revealing an attack on the g5 bishop. And at that point, white normally trades it for the f6 knight, and then the knight recaptures. And now uh, white gets the pawn back with knight takes c4 rather than bishop takes c4 because that attacks the queen, gains a tempo, and doesn't lose a tempo by moving that bishop twice. Okay, Black usually retreats the queen back to the c7 square, and the game proceeds from here. Black is a little bit passive, but he needs to get this bishop into play by a pawn break. So he wants to eventually push his pawn to c5 or this pawn to e5. One plan is to try to go for b6 and c5 and fianchetto that bishop. All right, let's go back to the critical position after queen to a5 right here, which starts the Cambridge Springs defense, and look at some other alternatives for white. Another thing the white player sometimes does in this position is play c takes d5, just clarifying the central uh, situation here. And if black takes back with a pawn, one of the two pawns, then that will interrupt any possible attack on the bishop on g5. But black shouldn't take back with a pawn. He should take back with his knight. Remember that knight is not pinned anymore once that queen has moved. This puts added pressure on that pinned c3 knight. Okay, and white can respond by playing a move like queen to d2 to protect it and to unpin it. And then bishop to b4 comes, pinning it again, attacking it again. Rook to c1 is a normal move, um, defending it again. And then the game continues from here. And, and black still needs to solve the problem of his light squared bishop, and eventually he'll get in some kind of pawn break like c5. Probably he should castle at this point, though. All right, and going back to the position after black enters the Cambridge Springs with queen to a5, um, another way white can play is bishop takes f6. Um, you can do that if you don't know any theory of the Cambridge Springs and you worry about that bishop being captured at some point. A lot of amateurs will play this move if they've ever faced the tactic where they've lost that bishop. They'll say, okay, well, I'll just exchange it right now and that way I'll never lose that bishop. Okay, and black recaptures with the knight. Um, and now it is safe for white to develop his bishop to the d3 square, the most active square. Okay, but then black can take on c4, gaining a tempo on that bishop, and then black can play bishop to d6, um, activating that bishop to its best square. And still, a good plan here might be b6 and c5 and fianchettoing that light squared bishop. And black is, again, a little bit passive as he is in, in a lot of queen's gambit declined lines, but he should be able to equalize with... Um, precise play. 
And now we'll go back and look at one final move in this position after queen to a5. Um, white can try bishop to d3 right away here, since his knight on f3 is defending the bishop, but it turns out not to be so good for white. The engine doesn't like that move and says now black has a slight advantage in the position. It's good to know what to do against this move bishop to d3, however. So black should take the pawn on c4, gaining a tempo here, so he's attacking that bishop. He's not attacking that bishop because it's defended by that knight. Okay, so white takes the pawn back, and now knight to e4, intensifying the pressure on the c3 knight. Okay, and then probably... Um, Oh, and that knight is now attacking that bishop, so it's doing double duty there. It's attacking the c3 knight and the bishop on g5, so now white needs to do something about his bishop, and he probably should retreat it to h4, the engine is telling me, and give up a pawn. So black can take that knight, and white has to recover, and black can take this pawn, but it's not actually the engine's top choice in the position, or, or it's close to the top choice. Um, white gets some good counterplay for the lost pawn. He has um, a better development, more active bishops at the moment, um, so he can get an initiative. So there are other moves to consider, such as maybe knight to b6 attacking that bishop, or uh, even b5 attacking that bishop, but it is safe to take the pawn. Um, that's, that's the engine's third choice I'm looking at right now. All right, anyway, um, it is an interesting opening, the Cambridge Springs defense, and it has been played by some top players, including Gary Kasparov and Magnus Carlsen, two of the best players in the history of the game. All right, so give it a try. It's black. Thanks for watching.